close today with uh, one area that was seemingly neglected and uh, isn't as easy to unify with uh, the blueprint as the other domains that we have studied uh, during the course. And specifically, I'll be talking about processing data that lives on sequences, especially under uh, time warping transformations. And this will lead us to a discussion of uh, recurrent neural networks and uh, uh, the various types of recurrent neural networks. And especially we will show a very uh, interesting and potentially surprising result that an entire popular class of recurrent neural networks will arise as a result of requiring invariance to a certain kind of time warping operation. So without further ado, uh, let's start with a brief recap from what we've seen in previous lectures. Through various lenses and guises, we've seen the geometric deep learning blueprint in action. And specifically, as a direct consequence of the analysis coming from the geometric blueprint, we have derived several uh, deep uh, learning architectures that uh, are more or less popular. And specifically, we've covered a wide spectrum, including deep sets, graph neural nets, transformers, convnets, group equivariant CNNs, spherical CNNs, and uh, intrinsic mesh CNNs. So quite a wide, uh, quite a wide spectrum. But uh, if you look at what uh, I showed you at the start of the sets and graphs lectures, uh, the list of popular architectures is instances of the blueprint. And if you look at what we have covered in lectures so far, here I've annotated the table with uh, what lecture roughly covered which architecture, you will see that we still have one very, very famous architecture, the long short-term memory or LSTM, that is uh, missing from the picture. And uh, it is actually somewhat harder to squeeze into the blueprint compared to the other ones. But some fairly recent research on time warping invariance gives a very nice way to observe uh, LSTMs and similar uh, recurrent models through the lens of uh, invariances to uh, certain transformations. And this is exactly what we will be studying today. So one very important distinction from what we'll be doing today and what we've been doing in previous lectures is that so far we've sort of always assumed a sort of spatial geometry across the domain. So, you know, the, the graph defined a particular geometry within its topology, uh, images and grids and so on defined a particular geometry around uh, uh, around a certain space and similarly meshes and uh, manifolds define also a certain more complex geometry. However, in many cases of interest, you won't just have spatial uh, configurations of your input such as video, text uh, and speech. And here I've given just you know two examples of uh, cars going on a road, which is a typical video input where every single frame might be an image that conforms to grid equivariance or invariance, but uh, it also has this temporal uh, movement. And on the right hand side, you might see an audio waveform, which typically arises when you record sound and uh, how it uh, has different uh, entries at different scales. So, what this means for us mathematically is that we will assume that we have an input that consists of several steps and at each step uh, of this input we will have a signal that's represented uh, with this uh, capital X of T. Once again I'm assuming a discrete domain meaning that I can represent my input signals using a matrix and at time T I will have signals coming from a certain input space over a domain at time T. And Note that what we'll be studying here is what happens as these inputs change through time. So we have kind of a one directional arrow of time. And you know, th that seems inherently asymmetric, right? So time goes forward, time doesn't really go backward. And therefore, it begs the question of do there even exist any useful geometric symmetries that we can use there, given that it only ever goes in one direction. And when I say useful symmetries, I am not counting any symmetries that are already present in the individual snapshot domains of omega t. So beyond those domains, we want to see if there's anything else that we can exploit. And one very important distinction we need to make before we go any further is does this domain over which we define our signals also evolve with time together with the signals? And in general, this is very much possible. 
However, throughout this lecture, I'm going to be assuming a much more simple case where the domain is assumed to be kept static throughout the entire uh, observation period. So we will assume that all omega t's are actually equal and they're equal to a particular domain omega that will store our signals throughout all time. And this might never be an okay inductive bias uh, in terms of like ground truth behavior. But in many cases, it's a very okay approximation to use. And uh, if you want to ask yourself the question of when do I need to model the domain changing together with the signal, it really depends on the time scales at which uh, the signals X change as opposed to the time scales at which the domain omega changes. So for example, imagine you have a road network data. So cars move a lot around the road network and you get snapshots of the road network at every point in time. Now, road networks are not static. They do change over time. Different roads get built, blocked or demolished. But usually the rate at which the roads change is much, much slower than the rate at which traffic traffic moves. So for all intents and purposes, you can assume when you're analyzing road traffic data that the road network is fixed, even if in principle it might change over time. Uh, one similar uh, but maybe not so obvious domain is social networks where uh, you might consider events such as different users connected on a graph of uh, uh, you know, different friendships or following. And typically it's assumed that uh, the engagement of users, such as writing posts or retweeting different uh, tweets, will happen a lot more frequently than the changes to the social network itself, such as different people following each other or unfollowing each other. So once again, in some cases, it might be okay to treat the social network as a static graph and just analyze the signals on that graph. Uh, in other cases, that may not be the case. And I will just note that uh, if you are interested to go beyond the content of this lecture and uh, uh, find out a bit more about how uh, domains can change dynamically, it is actually a, an exciting emerging area and there's already some research going on that you might want to consider here. Uh, one particular example that uh, is interesting, a piece of research that came out from, uh, from Twitter last year is the Temporal Graph Network which analyzes the information on various social networks and keeps track dynamically of different links forming or disappearing on the social network as time goes on. So that can be a pretty good reference to consider if you're interested to find out more. But for all intents and purposes here, we will be assuming that the, uh, uh, that the domain is always fixed and it's equal to a particular omega. And as I said, what we're interested in this lecture is not what are the symmetries in omega. That's something that we've already assumed to have covered in previous lectures, hopefully, as long as omega is a common enough domain, uh, like a mesh or a video uh, or, a, uh, or a graph. And uh, therefore we want immediately from the get-go to abstract away any symmetries that omega might contain. And what we're going to do basically is there's gonna be some encoder function f which uh, will be invariant or equivariant to the uh, specific symmetries that omega has. And it will encode for every single input step uh, a k-dimensional uh, real vector, okay? So for every uh, time step information x, this f will give us uh, a vector that we will call z of t. And uh, this can still work if you want a vector in every single node of your domain. In this case, we will replace the invariant f with an equivariant f, and uh, then it will give us a capital Z with a vector for every single uh, node of the domain. But for now, just to keep things extra simple, we will assume that f is an invariant function that attaches a vector to every single uh, time step. And that f will be learned together with anything else that we stitch into this architecture. But the point here is that uh, once we have applied f, all the symmetries contained in omega have already been exploited. And now our only remaining task is to summarize the z vectors. So the domain that we'll be looking at here is a form of 1D grid, but with an arrow of time going forward. So just to kind of make this super explicit, Imagine we have a time-lapse video of some cars moving in traffic and here I've given like four frames uh, of such a setting and those are the capital X's that I've just told you about. So those are the different video frames. Uh, we take some, uh, for example, translation invariant CNN and uh, we 
transform all of those capital X's into a summary vector ZT for every single time step of the video. And now our question is, what do we do with those Z's? This is, this is going to be the main topic of the lecture today. And uh, since I said that these Z's basically live on a one dimensional grid, this means that you can process them with any of the previously covered architectures that will operate over grids. So convolutional neural networks or even transformers could be a good fit here but uh, we are not going to be dealing with those models today and that is partly because they will not satisfy a certain thing that we actually would really want to have over temporal signals even though such models are getting more and more popular with uh, their scalability we want to study a model that will explicitly mimic the arrow of time and as a result very easily allow you to have data arriving online because you can imagine that with this model you have already processed the sequence up to time step t and then when time step t plus one comes in you can very quickly combine it with everything that's arrived before. So this kind of model is going to be perfectly suited for that and you might have heard about this model. It is uh, known as the recurrent neural network and at its core is this uh, so-called update function which uh, we will denote with capital R and it consumes a vector, uh, this Z vector corresponding to the current time step. And it uh, maintains another vector, which is M dimensional, and we call it the summary vector H. And combining the previous summary vector with the current uh, input vector Z, it updates the summary to produce the next H uh, at the next time step. So H of T is computed by applying R to Z of T and H of T minus one. Now, if you analyze the data flow of a model like this, you realize that we have to seed it somehow. We have to provide an H of zero from which all of the computation will emerge. And uh, without any additional priors, people tend to set this H vector to just zero. But um, actually, uh, before we dive into some int very interesting properties that R can satisfy, uh, we can first see how a special choice of H of zero can already make RNNs uh, have interesting symmetries that are uh, basically very similar to the ones we've seen in CNNs. So let's start by asking the question, are recurrent neural networks translation equivariant? Because, you know, they operate over a grid, they process this grid sequentially. It might be tempting to just naively extend any results we had for CNNs being translation equivariant and apply them to RNNs because they're both on a grid. But actually, RNNs are generally not translation equivariant. So let me just perform a left shift of my sequence by one step. So I have this new sequence Z prime, which uh, I obtain by just taking Z of the time step ahead. And let's try showing that uh, once we process uh, this Z prime using our RNN, the H prime will be the same as the initial H is shifted by one. This is what shift equivariance would imply. And well, let's see what happens when we set T equals one. So we want H prime of one to be equal to H uh, of one, uh, sorry, H of two. And, you know, I just expanded out the rules uh, of R and how they combine and what you can see is that if we want h prime of one to be equal to h of two, we need the initial summary vector h zero to be equal to the recurrent model applied to the time step one and h of zero. And actually, is there any way that we can guarantee this? So this is a necessary condition for our RNN to be translation equivariant. Is there any way we can guarantee that? Well, the problem is that H of zero is a sort of hyperparameter. You need to decide it upfront and it cannot really have knowledge of, uh, of the input time step, right? So you set H of zero without any knowledge of what's going to be in the input. And when you perform this left shift operation in order to be able to show equivariance, you've actually destroyed Z of one. You're not ever feeding Z of one into the model again. So, Actually, if we just treat sequences as starting from useful data and that's it, any kind of left shift destroys data and therefore equivariance cannot happen. So we have to study a slightly different problem and then we will be able to show equivariance. Specifically, what we need to do is we need to make sure that this left shifting will not destroy the data that we have. 
And accordingly, what we can do is left pad the sequence by zeros. So uh, we create this new padded sequence, Z bar, which has zeros for the first T prime steps and then afterwards the original sequence. Now what we can do is we can actually uh, shift uh, Z bar by up to T prime steps without losing any information about our original sequence. And actually, if you study shift equivariance over Z bar rather than Z, it is actually possible to guarantee uh, shift equivariance for RNNs. However, there is a condition that H of zero must satisfy. And uh, what I would like, like basically the way in which you're going to get these conditions is by running the same line of reasoning as we did here, only replacing Z with Z bar. And uh, yeah, I think it should be a nice exercise to go through those steps and figure out what are the conditions that the initial summary H of zero needs to satisfy. And as a bonus uh, part of that exercise, uh, could you tell me if there are any conditions on the recurrent network R for such an H zero to exist? So I will leave this as an exercise because it should be more or less the same line of reasoning as what you've seen in the previous slide but uh, it's, it's an interesting exercise to show nonetheless. Okay, so we've shown that if we squint hard enough and we transform the problem to suit our purposes, we can actually make RNNs equivariant to translations, but it certainly didn't feel as natural as CNNs. And unlike CNNs that you just apply in a same way across the grid and you can just parallelize very naturally, RNNs are actually inherently sequential. So data goes in one step at a time and you cannot process step at T plus one before you've plus processed the step at time T. So this, you know, the fact that RNNs can be made translation equivariant doesn't necessarily matter much in the long run. Uh, there is uh, like, there would need to be some deeper appeal and the reason why we're still using RNNs, uh, if, if not for the efficiency. So online data processing is one particular aspect where RNNs have traditionally been very useful because if you just have to process a very long stream of data where the data doesn't arrive all the time at the same rate, then RNNs are a pretty good choice for that because you can very quickly update them with incoming data. But, uh, is there any other kind of deeper theoretical appeal to using RNNs? And the answer is actually yes. And this will be the core part of our lecture today. Actually, if you set up the RNN properly, so under certain conditions on their update rule, RNNs can support a very, very useful kind of symmetry. And that symmetry arises from just asking the question of where do time series usually come from? So when you have a data which is organized in a time series, typically that data is not naturally a time series. It is some kind of continuous process that you're sampling from, right? So there's a continuous time signal and you're taking samples from that signal and you're presenting those, uh, those signals to a, a discrete model like an RNN. And you know, one very important question is in general, can we actually really thoroughly control this sampling rate at which the data points are coming? Can we even guarantee it's fixed? One example that is extremely sparse is if you have patients in the intensive care unit of a hospital, you will typically only record certain parameters from those patients when it's relevant for whatever their condition is or their diagnosis is. So there could be like really long periods over which you don't have any information about a particular patient parameter. And you know, the, the rate at which you will get that kind of information may vary drastically depending on what kind of measurements are being taken and when are they being taken. So that is just one simple example of a patient might have a certain parameter like oxygen saturation or uh, blood pressure or something like this. And you don't necessarily have that data point at regular intervals. You, there might be a day gap during which you don't have any measurements and then suddenly there's a huge uh, stream of data where they get measured every five seconds or something like that. So the sampling rate at which you observe this data can vary a lot. And one thing that we would very much like our deep learning models to be able to do is to allow us to, within some reasonable space of sampling rates, change the sampling rate dynamically and still be able to fit something like this with our model. So 
is it possible for our model to be resilient to drastically changing sampling rates? And uh, how can we make it super formal mathematically? What does it mean for a sampling rate to change? Well, what it means is in some sense modifying the unit of measurement. And it's gonna be much easier to reason about this if we assume that time is continuous. So within the space of continuous time, we can define a so-called time warping operation, tau. Uh, the reason why we use tau is because it matches our notation for automorphisms and tau is certainly an automorphism of time. And it takes time steps to time steps, so positive reals to positive reals and it must be monotonically increasing and differentiable. So it must be a smooth transformation of time. And I've just given here on the right hand side a very simple example of a time warping operation, a so-called time rescaling, where you have a constant factor alpha multiplied with your time. So here you have an example of the same signal which is warped with a time warping function uh, 0 0.7 times t. So here you have the original signal uh, in red at the bottom and the uh, time warped signal in blue. And I've drawn these sort of gray parallel lines to show to you how the flow of time is faster in the red curve compared to the blue curve. And what would this mean in a discrete setting is that you get a new input, uh, like a, an input that is new from the perspective of the original time series, every 1.43 steps. But just to be clear, rescaling is only a very simple special case where, this, where, the, where there's a fixed sampling rate and it changes. But actually what might happen in real life is that sampling may freely accelerate or decelerate. So it might, this tau might be a way more complicated function than just alpha times t. The only condition it needs to satisfy is it needs to be monotonic and differentiable. Okay. So what we want, as I said, is we want, uh, you know, we cannot control for this uh, exact time warping function that happens when we sample data in the real world. So what we would really, really like is uh, a class of models that will be invariant to time warping. So what this means is that for any sequence I have and any time warping applied to that sequence, there exists some model that will process the warped sequence the same way it would process the original one. So this means that basically, if we have the right class of models, we don't have to worry about which time warping was applied. So this kind of invariance is a potentially super useful one to have. And hopefully it's not too hard to see that convolutional neural networks are not time warping invariant. Here I've given one simple example of a 1D convolution neural network with uh, uh, a kernel of size three. And here you can see for, you have like a time series of 16 steps and uh, from inputs I to outputs O, and you can see how say a four layer CNN, the output at time step 16 can only see steps from 12 to 16, uh, like in terms of just pure reachability in red. And now what happens if I warp the sequence, I put a lot of zeros in between all of my inputs, suddenly I can just put enough zeros so that uh, the output point 16 will not be able to see any data that it was previously able to see. So as a result, um, as a result, it won't be able to be resistant to this kind of time warping. You'd have to change the architecture of the CNN. So this is, the CNNs are not a good example and they don't satisfy the time warping invariance. Uh, that being said, people have been aware of this problem in CNNs and they found a, a very uh, cost efficient way to make them far more resilient to such changes. And in particular, one very popular approach to making them more resistant is the so-called dilated or sometimes at which is the, the French term for with holes, uh, convolution neural networks which uh, basically what they do is the first layer of dilated convnets starts the same way as normal ones. But now you can see how uh, as the layers go up, you keep uh, making these three by three kernels more and more spread apart by basically inserting artificial zeros in the, in the kernel. And uh, the rate at which this grows is exponential. So here now suddenly after only four layers and the 16 step time series, the output at step 16 can now actually observe the entire sequence. So no matter how much you intersperse it with zeros, unless it gets really intense, it will be able to see what's going on within it. So this observation was super helpful when CNNs were used to model uh, waveforms, like raw audio waveforms. And this uh, kind of layer actually forms the essence of uh, DeepMind's WaveNet model, 
which is currently powering the text-to-speech systems uh, inside Google Assistant. So whenever you talk with Google Assistant, a convolutional model like this is producing the waveform one uh, sound data point at a time that you're listening to. And okay, it still it provides an exponentially increasing receptive field, but in principle, once you choose a convolutional dilated architecture, it still has a fixed receptive field. So there is still a possibly huge number of zeros I can insert after which I will lose visibility of some part of my sequence and I will not be resistant to that kind of time warping. So once again, from an empirical point of view, something like this definitely helps, but it doesn't theoretically solve the problem. You can still dilate the sequence sufficiently to uh, beat any fixed receptive field size. And uh, then recently transformers have been getting more and more popular for handling these all pairs interactions and as a result, at every point, every step of the sequence will have full context of the rest of the sequence. But as you remember from previous lectures, transformers inherently do not operate on a grid. They operate over complete graphs and they don't support translation equivariance. They support permutation equivariance. So as a result, they're not assuming their nodes to be in any order. We have to feed the temporal order through uh, implicit features that are put as positional embeddings to every node. So while transformers may be able to get a decent feel for what the, tempor what the temporal alignment in the sequence is, they certainly are not invariant to time warping because inherently they're not designed to be resistant to any grid operations. So they may be attractive, but once again, theoretically, they're not what we want in this particular case. So, okay, we have exhausted all of the obvious choices. We are just left with recurrent neural networks. And uh, what uh, the basis of our discussion today is going to be is this uh, seminal paper from Corentin Talek and uh, Jan Olivier on can recurrent neural networks warp time that was published at uh, the iClear conference in 2018, which actually showed that under certain constraints uh, on recurrent neural networks, they can be invariant to time warping operations. And this uh, was a very important result because it showed how just starting from the principles of what we want such a model to achieve, we can show that the class of recurrent neural networks that was already the most power, uh, popular one um, actually is exactly the class that satisfies these constraints. So let's see how uh, Talek and Olivier have been, have been able to show this. So as mentioned before, time warping is something that is very naturally defined in the continuous domain and things start to get a bit weird whenever you try to move back from continuous to discrete. So I'm actually going to start the analysis uh, of time warping invariance by uh, starting in the continuous domain. So uh, whenever you see boldface h and z of t, that is a discrete vector signal at time step t. Whenever you see, uh, you know, just italic h and z of t, that is a function, a continuous function that's defined for every uh, point in time. So we can imagine a sort of analog of a discrete RNN, which is called a cont which we which we can call a continuous RNN that takes an input continuous signal z of t and computes a summary signal h of t. And the way in which we're going to link the continuous and the discrete is by looking at these uh, so-called Taylor expansions around uh, time t. So specifically, uh, we're going to see what does h of t, how can h of t roughly be approximated by a uh, degree one uh, polynomial. And uh, especially around time t, uh, a one uh, step Taylor expansion tells us that h at a point t plus delta is approximately equal uh, up to a certain error term uh, uh, to h of t plus delta times the derivative of h of t uh, with respect to t. And well, now if I just take this Taylor expansion and I set delta to one, then this gives me a relationship between h of t plus one to h of t. And this in a way is exactly what our recurrent neural network update R does. So just doing a bit of algebra and swapping things around and setting delta to one, we can find that uh, 
the recurrent update rule of RNNs uh, satisfies the following ordinary differential equations. So the derivative of uh, the summary dh by dt is equal to the application of the recurrent network to z of t plus 1 and h of t uh, subtracted uh, uh, from the, uh, the h of t. So this differential equation is something that every recurrent network should roughly satisfy based on the Taylor expansion property. Okay, so now we have uh, uh, a good starting point that links the continuous h and z of t signals to the recurrent update r. And now we're in a position where we can try applying a time warp tau to the signal and see how it processes. If our model class is time warping invariant, then when it observes a warped signal, z of tau of t, it should then produce exactly h of tau of t. This would imply that it's time warping invariant. So if you use the same Taylor series argument and uh, obtain an ODE that this model must satisfy, you get uh, basically the same equation as we had before. The only difference is that now you're taking a derivative with respect to the warped time tau of t, but otherwise the expression is exactly the same. But because you're taking this derivative with respect to the warped time, you're taking it with respect to you know the, the time which this warped uh, model observes. You're not taking into account the fact that this rate got changed from the original signal. So what we actually want is the derivative of the warped summary h of tau of t with respect to the original flow of time dt. And what this means is that we need to combine the rule we have above with an appropriate application of the chain rule. So uh, you know, if I want to compute dh of tau of t by dt, that is the same as taking the derivative of h of tau of t by uh, the warped time and the derivative of the warped time with respect to the time. And combining these two with the equation that we had before, so dh by d tau we have already computed in the previous slide, now we just have to multiply that expression with the warping derivative d tau by dt. And as a result, we will get this ODE here. So the derivative of the warped time with respect, uh, sorry, of the warped signal with respect to the original time must be equal to the warping derivative times the recurrent network rule applied to the warped inputs and the previous warped summary minus the warping derivative times the previous warped summary. If our recurrent neural network can satisfy this ODE, then it will be time warping invariant. Okay, so for now we have expressed the requirement that the RNN must have for this, uh, uh, for this time warping invariance to be satisfied, but uh, we've stayed in continuous space. So we need to now make the leap from continuous space into discrete space. And specifically, what we can do is once again, just start from a Taylor series. And uh, in this case, it must be a warped summary. So h of tau of t plus delta can be, uh, you can take the, the linear Taylor expansion, which is a decent approximation under certain properties that we will mention. And that Taylor expansion is roughly equal to the warped summary plus delta times the, warp, uh, the warped summary derivative. And now once again, you can set delta to one and remark that uh, uh, the, uh, the discrete RNN sees z of t, which is in the warped case, z of tau of t, and computes h of t, which is h of tau of t. This then, like taking the previous uh, equation and using the facts we showed before, and I've left this as an exercise, you can take the facts from the previous slides and apply a few steps of reasoning to arrive at this particular equation. So the time warping invariant RNN must implement an equation like this at the bottom of this particular slide. So the way in which you derive your next step summary must be a uh, time warp derivative uh, times the update of the RNN of the current step and the previous summary plus one minus the time warping derivative of the previous value of the summary. So uh, I've left it as an exercise for you to drive this rule using all the equations that we've shown before uh, in this deck.
And it's a very useful exercise to do. I would recommend doing it. And okay, so I've just restated that equation here so we can observe it while we draw some conclusions from it. So we want our RNN to be able to implement something like this for any time warping operation tau of t that is uh, decent enough. And one way in which you can interpret this rule because you have you know, a warping derivative here and the one minus a warping derivative here is that what you want is for the derivative of the time warping to control how much of the previous summary you should overwrite. So the, more, the, the stronger the derivative, the faster the time moves, the more relevant the current signal is for the summary and you should use more of it and use less of the previous summary. And what's very important is that we don't assume that we know tau of t up front, okay? So this is the thing which is making the implementation tricky. If we knew the derivative immediately, we could just uh, swap it into the rule and obtain a recurrent neural network model that will, that will fit it properly, right? And specifically, one, uh, one of the earliest applications where RNNs were introduced is the so-called simple RNN model, which was independently in various forms introduced by uh, Jordan in 1986 and Elman in 1990, which uh, just does a simple MLP to update the summaries. So for them, the RNN computes h of t plus one as some uh, activation function of uh, a linear combination of the uh, current input, previous summary, and uh, some bias vector. So these w, u, and b are just learnable parameters. You can think of this as a multi-layer perceptron applied to z and h. And in this case, you're just taking whatever z, t plus one, and h of t are giving you, and you're taking that as your next summary. So there's no explicit residual term that preserves the previous HT. So if you remember the form for time warping invariance, you need to have some residual term here that will allow a part of the old H of T to be preserved. So if that term does not exist, then you know that these simple RNNs are actually implicitly assuming that the time warping derivative is always one. And if the time warping derivative is always one, that means that there's actually no warping. Tau of T is equal to T. So simple RNNs only theoretically work in the scenario where there's no time warping. And as a result, they are not invariant to time warping. So this is very important to note. You cannot just plug any RNN and expect it to be time warping invariant. We need to be very careful with what kind of update we do to Z and H. Okay, so as I said, we cannot actually expect to know the time warping derivative up front unless it's actually given to us. So what we have to do in general is we learn a neural network that approximates this derivative. So based on the current z and h, this uh, new function gamma will try to approximate a real value which will tell you what's the warping derivative in this particular point. And it's once again sufficient for this gamma to just process z of t plus one and h of t because they store everything that you've observed so far. And uh, if you plug this learnable gamma into the form that we know that time warping invariant models must have, you'll end up with a rule like this. So h of t plus one is equal to gamma times the output of the recurrent model plus one minus gamma times the previous summary. Okay, so, so far so good. This looks like, uh, this looks like a nice rule that we can use. And once again, you can see how simple RNNs arise when you just set gamma always equal to one. And are there any other constraints that we can attach to gamma? Well, actually, yes, because there is a very important assumption that I've been making throughout this uh, lecture ever since I used the first Taylor approximation. And that is that the Taylor approximation is a good enough approximation. And in principle, there will be a small enough error term in the Taylor approximation as long as the time warping derivative is not very large, specifically as long as d tau by dt is uh, not bigger than one. And what does this intuitively mean is that your time warping shouldn't become very fast. It should not over contract time because if the sampling rate becomes uh, uh, so bad that you are going to actually miss a particular time point in the middle, 
uh, you'd end up over contracting time too much and you'd have no hope of processing the two sequences in the same way. However, arbitrary time dilations are completely allowed. And this is very important for RNN processing because very often you'd expect them to have to capture information at very long time scales. And you can think of information at long time scales as information that, chart, that starts on short time scales and then a very long dilation is applied. So since we know that the warping derivative, as long as we're assuming data hasn't been destructively lost, is not too large, so it doesn't exceed one. And we also know from our initial assumption that you know, the time must be monotonically increasing. It cannot, we cannot go backwards in time. So the derivative of tau can never be uh, less than zero and it can never be equal to zero either. Time cannot stand still either. So basically we know that the value of these, of these gamma function always has to be between zero and one for the reasonable scenario that we're, that we're, that we're looking at. And actually, if we have a function gamma that takes some inputs and produces an output between zero and one, this is something that we can interpret as a so-called gating mechanism. And you might have seen this in various architectures such as uh, GRUs or LSTMs. And how we normally arrive at gating mechanisms in deep learning is we typically use the logistic sigmoid activation. So that's the, the standard activation that gives you probabilities for say a binary cross entropy uh, problem. So simple like uh, uh, binary logistic regression. So some kind of MLP applied to Z's, uh, H's with some biases and uh, weight vectors and then you apply the logistic activation to the result to get the value between zero and one. And now that can be a great way to model gamma. And any recurrent neural network that uses such a gamma somewhere is called a gated RNN. And uh, so far I've been implying that, you know, the only requirement we have is for gamma to output a single scalar. But uh, in principle, most of these gated RNNs uh, try to increase their expressivity by making gamma output a vector of zero one probabilities. And what this means uh, semantically is that you can choose to overwrite dimensions of H of T separately for different dimensions. And this allows you to more easily separate processing of data at different timescales. And in fact, gated RNNs, uh, you might have heard of them because they are the dominant variant of recurrent neural networks nowadays. So models such as the long short-term memory or LSTM or the gated recurrent unit or GRU are both special cases of the gated RNN architectures because they feature gates in various parts. So what uh, I want to show just kind of to close off the discussion and to finally link it back to an actual architecture is to show you just quickly, if you haven't seen it before, the long short-term memory architecture and how it relates to this blueprint. So LSTMs, you probably heard of them. They're one of the oldest and most popular gated RNNs and they use an explicit memory cell, C of T, that persists uh, data across different time steps. And I've shown that only one gate is in principle enough to model the time warping derivative, but LSTMs, you know, they, they take several steps further than that. They actually use gating extensively and they decide several things in a gated manner. How much of the new features that come at time step T plus one should be allowed in the cell, how much of the previous cell vector to forget. And then once you finally computed the output based on all that, how much of the output vector should be allowed out of the LSTM. Originally, they were proposed with the motivation of uh, modeling and addressing the issue of vanishing gradients. And essentially, because they have all these gates, the LSTM decides how much of the data should vanish in a way that's purely data driven. And because they fix the vanishing gradient problem that many of these sigmoidal functions like logistic or hyperbolic tangent have, typically in LSTMs, you're allowed to freely use the tang activation and they're the more common choice. So this is the summary of the most commonly used LSTM equations that you might've come across before. So first, based on, just like we did in simple RNNs, based on the current time step and the previous summary, we compute some vector of candidate features, which we call C tilde, that should enter the memory cell. And then uh, you compute various gates, input, output, and forget gates based on uh, the current time step and the previous summary, which tell you all of these various design decisions. And finally, using these gates and the candidate features, you can compute the, what's the next value that should be placed in the cell. So the next value to go in the cell is a combination of 
some level of these new candidate features modulated by the input gate and some level of the previous cell features modulated by the forget gate. So the forget gate tells you how much of the previous context should you forget. And finally, um, finally, once you have these uh, cell vectors updated, you can do one last step of processing by applying a tanch to them and uh, multiplying them with the output gate, which decides how much information you should let out of the cell. And that is your summary vector at time step t. Now, this is a lot of equations, and if you haven't seen it before, it might be a bit tricky to visualize them all at once. So I've prepared this uh, particular kind of data flow diagram so you can see how the data moves. So the LSTM cell starts with inputs Z of T, H, T minus one, and also there's a memory cell which stores a previous uh, cell state, C, T minus one. And first, based on uh, H and Z, we compute the values of these various gates and also the next step features, C tilde. C tilde is multiplied by the input gate. The previous cell state is multiplied by the forget gate. Those two are added together and fed back into the cell. And finally, there's a tanch applied, which gets multiplied with the output gate to produce the next step outputs. Uh, if this is a lot of uh, content and you haven't seen LSTMs before, I have shared the handout on, on Campus Wire, so you can take a look and uh, consult this diagram again, just to be sure that uh, all the different pieces are clicking. And now that I've showed you the generic form of gate that are in ends and how they satisfy time warping invariance and LSTMs is a special case, uh, which is very popular. It's worth to pause and reflect on what we've done today. What we wanted is a model class that's resistant to any non-contractive time warping. And we've shown how previous models that might be applicable on grids, such as CNNs or maybe even transformers, are in principle theoretically unable to do so. And then we derived what is needed for a discrete recurrent neural network to satisfy this invariance. And it turns out as long as it uses some form of a gating mechanism, it has all the power it needs to explicitly model the time warping derivative. So starting from the basic principles of invariance, we've derived an entire class of gated RNNs which satisfy that invariance. And it happened that this class of models actually matched what were the most popular uh, RNN models. So LSTMs, GRUs, and so on. So the purpose of this gating mechanism, now you can interpret it as not just you know, uh, dynamically learning how much to forget, it actually has a very explicit purpose to fit whatever is the time warping derivative with which you're sampling your data. And one very important thing to note is that what we've derived is not the invariance in the sense that we've seen in previous lectures. It's a form of so-called class invariance. And it's distinct to the ones we've seen before because what we're not saying that if I train an RNN to produce H of T from Z of T, that that same RNN will produce H of tau of T from Z tau of T, no matter what tau I choose. Actually, that kind of zero shot transfer is usually not possible because H, uh, because Z of T and Z of tau of T are not the same time series. They're not gonna have the same inputs. So you cannot very easily guarantee that the, the outputs will follow that same, that same pattern. What class invariance actually says is the following. Assuming that there is an RNN architecture that will produce a desirable H of T from a Z of T, then there must exist another RNN with exactly the same architecture, so from the same class, same hyperparameters, but potentially different weights, okay? That will produce the desirable warped summary from a warped input for any tau. And what this is, is a sort of peace of mind result that's very useful to us when we want to apply a model like this, because it says, no matter how we warp the signal, as long as we haven't warped it in a destructive way, so no matter how much we dilate the sampling, for example, there will exist a recurrent neural network with the same architecture that will fit it in the same way as the ideal unwarped sequence. And this is a very strong property that motivates uh, multiple timescale learning properties of RNNs and are the reason why they're such a popular model nowadays. And just to highlight, there actually exists one case where we can zero shot an RNN that was learned on one warping to another. Uh, and specifically when one time warping is a rescaling of another, so there's just the coefficient of alpha in front of the time warp. That means we can get, uh, we can get uh, exactly the same processing if we just modulate the gates. So 
if uh, we make uh, the gamma function for gate two uh, for uh, time warping two alpha times whatever was the gating function learned for time warp one that will give us perfect invariance so this is one case where we don't have to change the weights we just have to change the function of the gating so what have we covered in today's lecture is the final big missing piece to our geometric deep learning blueprint which is processing data on these temporal grids or sequences we've discussed recurrent neural networks as a canonical method in this space and we've shown if you squint hard enough, RNNs can support translation equivariance, but uh, a much better and much deeper motivation, which CNNs or transformers cannot satisfy, is they're able to cope with varying sampling rates, specifically because they are a model class that's invariant to time warping. And by analyzing the requirement of time warping, we've derived gated RNNs as a solution to that invariance. And specifically, we've shown that LSTMs are one specific instance of gated RNNs that are very popular and how they fit within the blueprint. So what we've done now over the space of the previous uh, six lectures or so is we've covered the entire table of key GDL architectures. And for the final lecture that Michael will be given uh, in a few hours, we will survey some of the impactful applications of geometric deep learning and give an outlook of how we believe the area will develop in the future.